boy Russia wants to drag the world into a new Cold War. Good boy NATO is saving the world. We're taking a strong but balanced strategic approach. An approach that seeks to ensure Russia cannot force anyone to turn her toward the past, all the while welcoming and encouraging Russia to turn back toward the future. Isn't that a nice Hollywood plot? Superheroes against a Russian villain. The New York Times has already come up with a scenario called the fantasy Mr. Putin is selling. Although it's the New York Times which is the best in selling fantasies about Putin. And here's what it takes according to them. First, you make sure everyone gets that Putin is a jerk. He's aggressive. Again. He's aggressive if you missed it the first time. And he's using people as props. What a... He's a monkey with a gun. Putin wields nukes and brings the world closer to war. The collapse of NATO, that's his ultimate goal. You know what's the worst? He's completely irrational, driven by his desire to destroy. And if you don't feel this way or don't agree, then you just probably have bought his blatant lies. Because Putin is great at telling tales. He creates fantasies, mythology, tells stories. He's probably the biggest liar of them all. While Putin is a bigger villain than Hannibal Lecter, Voltimore, the Joker altogether, NATO is a nice, soft, fluffy little alliance. <laughs> But a kitty cat can turn into a tiger, says the New York Times. The good guy NATO is measured and focused on diplomacy, but it can show its claws in the face of Russian aggression. Allies should be defended. The tone and the signs are set now. The New York Times fantasy needs a conclusion, a happy ending to their tale, and they have one that is top notch. If Putin doesn't back down, he'll see NATO expanding, not because NATO wants to expand, but because Russia's behavior has left it little choice. In your face, Russia. Russia's provocations. Russia's aggression. Bloody Russians, they keep moving their country closer to our bases. There you go, totally clear why Russia would be blamed. The number of displaced people in the world is on record high, almost 60 million according to the UN Refugee Agency. It's the worst crisis since the Second World War by some estimates. Ukraine, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, it looks like wars are becoming a usual thing.
In Ukraine, a soloist who was banned from playing a Canadian music hall over her so-called biased tweets about the military crisis there is more than welcome in the war zone itself. Valentina Lysitsa, who's Ukrainian-born herself, will be giving a concert in Donetsk. It starts in just 30 minutes, less than that, and she joins us from there just before this concert. Valentina, I hope you can hear me. What made you go all the way to Donetsk to play your music? Yes, yes, Anissa, I can hear you pretty well. We from all the and today, of course, it's very symbolic day. It's June 22, the date when Nazi Germany basically entered Soviet Union and we started Great Patriotic War. And it's a special day. It's a fantastic day for people to remember their dead and to think of victory which we once already achieved and now it repeats again. And we're again 70 years from now fighting with the same Nazi ideology and we hope that we win this war. At least from people that I saw and I met, I know that they're here to win and they're hoping for a great future, for peace and for happiness. Now this is the first time you've been back in Ukraine, I understand, since the conflict began. What has been your reaction to the devastation, to meeting these people in the east of the country? You know, I saw what was happening here for a year in pictures, but nothing could possibly prepare me when I saw it with my own eyes. When I came here yesterday, I saw the destroyed buildings, the results of bombing. I saw bombed schools, bombed cultural centers, but I also saw people in the street. I saw many children enjoying a wonderful summer day. I saw people in love walking, holding their hands on beautiful banks of the river. I saw how much people take care of their city. It's amazing, you know. I I wish American senators or politicians from West, from Europe, they would come one day not to Kiev or to Kharkov or to all the popular places with them, but come actually here and see the people and see the city with their own eyes and they would understand what real patriotism is about. Because patriotism, the love of one's motherland, is taking care of this land, taking care of the city and not hatred towards others. I was absolutely stunned with how city looks like. Despite all the bombings, despite the war, we heard the cannonade the other evening. But still, people are enjoying life. They're hoping for a wonderful future. They're making plans for future. And it's very strong people, strong-willed people. And they're here to win and to get the happiness they deserve. And they're determined to make their own future, not to have future dictated to them at the great cost of human lives. I want to ask you a question. This is from one of our viewers, and they're writing in, what composition will you play perhaps tonight that reflects the developments and the destruction in Ukraine? What message do you want to send to the people of the East? Well, first of all, classical music, music is a strong message by itself. You know, we're commemorating the anniversary of, of the beginning of the war, but we're commemorating it with classical music, because classical music and culture, this is what unites us as human beings. This is our common heritage. And when we listen to classical music, we understand that on our planet, we're small family, we're friends, we're brothers, sisters, and the music belongs to all of us. This is a message of peace. We'll be playing pieces by Rachmaninov, by Tchaikovsky, Prokofiev, who was born here, actually, in Donetsk, near Donetsk, and we're playing Shostakovich Great Symphony. Now, you, of course, the first time we talked so, on our show so, had so, just been... But I'll continue. Yes. Had just been banned from uh, playing in Canada, of course, the last time we spoke. Tell us a little bit more about the developments there. How are you being treated in the West as someone who continues to speak out about what's happening in Ukraine, not exactly in line with a lot of um, the Western views, so to say? 
You know, first of all, I'm playing the same piece, Rachmaninoff's second concerto, which music lovers in Toronto were denied because of this very aggressive and very vocal war lobby, local lobby. So what lovers of music lost in Toronto, music lovers in Donetsk today will enjoy. But I think my message was to people, at least because, you see, I'm not a professional politician, I'm a musician, and that's why people trusted me, because they know that I'm here not for some material economic reason, I'm not Moscow troll, you know, as some people would try to spin it. I'm talking about my people because my heart hurts for these people. This is my family, this is my friend, this is my land where I'm standing right now. And, you know, even if I made just few hundred or few thousand people think over or at least become curious not to be passive consumers of the news, what was fed to them, I think I achieved my aims. And today, with this message of music, which unites people, I think more people, you know, I, I'm being followed as musician by millions of people worldwide, not only in the United States or Canada or Japan, everywhere. And these people are paying attention, particularly young people. And I do think that public opinion is changing towards understanding what's happening here. It's changing slower than we think, than we hope, but it does. And I'm really hopeful for the best, for a great future. I think that's a great place to leave it. I'm going to let you go because, of course, your concert starts in just over 15 minutes. Valentina Lissitz, a pianist and activist, who will be performing in Dynesk in just a couple of minutes with us in the now. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, we talk to a man pledging to change London from a city for the rich to a city for all. George Galloway is in the now. Stay with us. Saudi Arabia is leaking. A vast array of cables released by WikiLeaks to shed light on tens of thousands of top secret documents. Here's what caught our eyes. Media manipulations. The Saudi Interior Minister of Culture and Media approved payments to several media outlets across the region. The Saudis don't like Iran. Well, we knew that, but one document mentioned specifically a strong desire for regime change by Iranian citizens and encouragement by the Saudis to spread the message on social media and increase the profile of opposition activists. And then there's Israel. Urgent memos about seemingly unimportant Israeli events at embassies prove the Saudis' only common tie with Israel is opposing Iranian influence in the region. But my all-time favorite is this one. Unpaid Saudi royal bills. A princess is said to have left Switzerland without paying a $1.6 million limo fee. Talk about a free ride. How do you like your coffee? I like my coffee like I like my man. Hot, black, Strong. Well, the wife of the Israeli interior minister served up some steamy controversy with a bad version of a good joke on Twitter about U.S. President Barack Obama. Judy Moses, who's also a TV host, posted this comparing Obama to a weak cup of coffee. She soon removed the tweet and apologized, admitting it was inappropriate and saying she hopes she didn't offend anyone. But it was too late. Some called her outright a horrible woman who should be ashamed. Others said it was brutal. And some simply dismissed the joke as inappropriate, ugly, and stupid. Now something that should be causing a scandal, but is not. You can now like the Israeli occupation on Facebook, officially. The agency, which oversees the occupied lands of Palestine, came up with a new social media page. So far, they have just over 1,200 likes and a sea of negative comments. On the page, people post videos of brutalities by the IDF against Palestinians, banners comparing Israeli rule in the occupied lands with apartheid in South Africa. Israel is being called an oppressor 
on its own PR page. Austerity Now protests took over London streets this weekend. Tens of thousands of people in what is said to have been the biggest anti-government protest yet voiced their outrage with British leaders. I stand with those people that have come to this country. Work! Well, one British politician wants to build a city that benefits all, not just those dripping in gold. The respected party leader who lost his MP seat in last month's elections and has announced he's running for mayor of London. George Galloway joins us in the now from London. Good to see you. Tell us, how can you, you. change London? Well, London needs a leader that will fight for the vast majority of Londoners who've benefited nothing especially in the last eight years, with the crash and with London being governed by the metropolitan elite for the metropolitan elite. It seems you have to be exceedingly rich to be the Tory mayor of London. We've got Boris Johnson now, the blonde buffoon uh, from Eton College, the uh, exclusive uh, school for the rich and powerful in our country and the Bullingdon Club, which he shared with David Cameron at Oxford University. And now the Conservatives want to put up the richest man ever to stand for an election in Britain. Uh, Zach Goldsmith, the inheritor of a million dollar a month in interest alone, uh, trust fund from his multi-billionaire father. Now, he's a fine fellow, to be sure, but there's no doubt that he knows nothing about the lives of ordinary Londoners. So I'm taking the fight right to the heart of what the problems are here. On Wednesday, the 1st of July, along with my running mate, uh, RT's own Max Kaiser, we're going right into Treasure Island, as we call the city of London, the financial district. X marks the spot. Next May, 11 months from now, people can break into Treasure Island and use it for the benefit of the millions, not the millionaires and billionaires. So Max Kaiser, it's official. He will be part of your campaign. You can confirm this here he's in the my now. Chief, uh, Why Max? Yes, he's my chief. Uh, well, Max Kaiser strikes terror into the hearts of the banksters and the cheats whose recklessness and even malfeasance, even theft, took Britain to the brink of national bankruptcy. He understands the city better than anyone else in this town. And everybody who's watched him on RT knows that he knows inside out what these people are thinking and what they are doing. So he's my chief economics and financial correspondent. And if we win the mayoralty in 2016, you'll see a stream of the very richest of these bankers heading for the coast. That's the Côte d'Azur, of course, where most of them have salted away their millions. It takes a lot of money, speaking of millions, to win a campaign in Britain, in Europe, in the United States. So what are going to be your main challenges in terms of getting elected? Well, we've launched now a crowdfunding scheme on startjoin.com forward slash George Galloway. And uh, people can give, the masses, the public can give, and we hope that they will. It's only just gone up in the last few hours. Let's see how it does. But our fundraising will be in pennies and pounds, not in uh, thousands and tens of thousands. That's for sure. But what we have is a zeitgeist. The zeitgeist, not just in Britain, but also elsewhere. Barcelona has just elected a mayor just like the mayor I hope to be. Madrid uh, may very well do uh, very shortly. In other parts, even in New York, people have gone for a mayor directly elected from outside the mainstream political parties because they know, as I put it colorfully, these parties are all different cheeks of the same backside. And most people in London, I assure you, want to give that backside a whack. 
All right, former UK MP George Galloway with us in the now from London, where he's running for mayor in 2016. Thanks so much. Rumours over collusion between loyalists who killed hundreds in Northern Ireland and British security forces have been going on for years. But a new documentary on the Troubles has shed more light on the extent of the UK government's involvement with secret death squads, including the Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher. executive of American fashion brand J. Crew was fired after publicly mocking almost 200 people that he fired himself after telling his staff they were redundant. Alejandro Rett, vice president of the menswear department, took to Instagram. He uploaded pictures of himself, including an impromptu photo shoot referring to the Hunger Games films. There was another one with just the middle finger. The hashtag, may the odds be ever in your favor. Clearly, he treats the people he fired like losers. And another one, at a bar with friends, hashtag, no fun here. Of course, he obviously has more fun firing people. The pictures have been deleted, but you know what? The odds were not in your favor. That does it for us tonight. Thanks for watching. Send your comments and story ideas at In The Now RT on Twitter or drop us a line on Facebook. I'll see you tomorrow. Till then, it's now or never.